the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. Now, Romans chapter 7, this just came to me this morning. This is the first time I, I really saw this clear. But in Romans chapter 7, Paul is talking to us. He's talking about being delivered from the law. But what he's really getting at, what the Lord, I believe, is even getting at at a deeper level is being delivered from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I'm going to explain this in a minute. But that's what Romans 7 is about. And then Romans 8 is about learning to live by the tree of life. And you can read it right in there. But I want to start with, with uh, verse 4. And, and Paul's talking and he says, My brethren, you were made to die to the law through the body of Christ. What does the law do? The law defines what is good and what is evil. The law gives you knowledge of what is good and what is evil. And then the law says, you must and you shall do this and you shall do that. That's exactly what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil did. And so what Paul's telling us, Paul's telling us that you were made to die to the law through the body of Christ. When Christ died on the cross and said, it is finished, and you are in him, you died with him. So you have been delivered. You have died to the law. You have died to the definition and the, uh, the knowledge of what is good and what is evil. And so what I have found, if you, if you can understand what I'm going to teach you today, this revelation has absolutely transformed my life. This is, if you can get what I'm going to talk to about today, it will radically change your life. For most of my life, most of my Christian life, I have been pursuing the Lord wholeheartedly for 25 years. For most of those 25 years, I have lived from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I have lived by that tree. This is what is good. Do that. This is what is evil. Avoid that. Do it in your own power and in your own strength. The knowledge, which is the soul, which is the brain. So much of Christianity is about knowledge. I mean, in the, not, not, not as the Bible wants it to be, but in the modern Western church, it's about getting more knowledge. And if you get the knowledge of what is good and what is evil, then you can live the Christian life. Then you can do what is good. What is good? It's, it's good to spend time with the Lord. It's good to pray. It's good to do these other things. And evil, it's evil to gossip, or it's evil to lust, or it's evil to have pride. Do your very best to do good and avoid evil. And I would say that most Christians and especially in America, I would say around the world, 95 or more percent of Christians today are living like the Old Testament Jews. Except now the law is not the 613 commandments of Moses, it's now the New Testament commandments. And we haven't yet seen what Paul is getting at here in Romans chapter 7, verse 4. He says, therefore, my brethren... You were made to die to the law. You were made to die to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Just put it that way. So that you might be joined to another. This is so beautiful. This is so beautiful. What God is doing in the cross of Jesus Christ was when Jesus died on that tree, you died with him. You died to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil so that now you would be joined to him. Spirit to spirit union with Christ. That's incredible. The indwelling life of Jesus Christ, the tree of life that has now come back into the garden when he was raised from the dead in the garden. And now he became a life-giving spirit. That tree of life has now been joined to you spirit to spirit. You've died from one tree, and you're alive to another tree. And he says, so that you 
might bear fruit for God. See, we can never bear fruit for God apart from his life. It takes that life, the life of Christ, in us to live the Christian life. It's impossible without it. And if we try in our own strength, in our own power, in our own ability to live the Christian life, we will fail. We might succeed for a short time, but over time, I promise you, you will burn out. And Paul looked at the Galatians and he said, Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? You know, you received uh, the Spirit by faith, and now you're trying to be perfected by the flesh. You're trying to be sanctified by your own willpower. You're trying to be good by your own human ability. What, what, who has bewitched you? It's actually witchcraft. To try to live the Christian life apart from the life of Jesus that Paul is talking about right here. You have been joined to another. You have been connected to Christ who has raised you up from the dead. The indestructible life, Zoe life of Jesus Christ has raised you up from the dead. That is beautiful. He is the one who breathes life into the dry bones. The very breath of God that came on Pentecost has breathed into your spirit and raised your spirit up so that now the life of Jesus himself dwells in you. Your spirit is connected to him spirit to spirit. It's so incredible. Yet what happens is we still continue to live by the soul. We continue to live by knowledge. Tell me the 10 steps. Tell me the five things I need to do. Tell me these three keys or tell me this, this, and that, and I'll go out and I will do it. Rather than living by the indwelling life of Christ. See, we still, even in being this for, for so many years, we still get caught up in the you must and the you shalls instead of learning to let Christ in you live his life. And what I've come to realize is that most people don't have a revelation of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In fact, some, some teachers are even saying we need to disconnect ourselves from the Old Testament. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil has defined human history for thousands and thousands of years. And so I think, I think we need to really understand what exactly happened when Adam ate from that tree. See, when he ate from that tree, what happened is uh, exactly what Satan said, exactly what Lucifer said, you shall be as gods. Self-deification. The self-life was put on the throne. And so the self-life now becomes enthroned and self now is living. See, what also happened is that now the, the soul, the mind, the will, and the emotions are now become the leader, the life source of humanity, so that now humanity lives by their mind, what they can think, what they can will, how they feel. That becomes the life source of humanity. And it's really also, you think about the good side of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's a good side to it. So much of what is done that we call good is like what Terry Bennett said, it's the beautiful side of evil. It's just human goodness, which is an abomination to Christ, to God. Human goodness is an absolute abomination to the Lord. And so God wants to deliver us from the good and the evil of this tree. See, how many of us have lived our whole lives trying to be quote-unquote good? Trying to be a good Christian, trying to live a moral life, you know, in our own strength, in our own power, that's living from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. See, that tree put into us selfishness, independence, and rebellion. It severed our link with God by the Spirit to live by the soul 
and what we could think and what we could know. We, we began to live by brain power. What the brain can think. Knowledge is power. Isn't that the, what drives so much of this world today? Knowledge is power. You get knowledge. Now, how much of that has come into the church? We want to know this doctrine. We want to know this teaching. We want to know these principles. We want to know these keys so that then we can take that knowledge, that brain power, put it into practice and do it. That's living from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, whether it's been Christianized or not. This making sense? It, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil gives knowledge of what is good and what is evil. Be good, do good, avoid evil, refrain from evil. See, so, so many Christians are burning out trying to live the Christian life, which is impossible to live. You can never live the Christian life. Only Christ in you can live that life. And I promise you, he's really good at it. If we will let him live rather than I, him empowering us rather than ourselves, Christ in us will, allow, will form his nature and his, his image in us and empower us with his grace to live this life. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said that, talking about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that it's the essence of all religion. He's exactly right. It's the essence of humanism. It's the essence of Judaism. It's the essence of Islam. And it's the essence of the quote-unquote Christian religion. See, I mean, you see it in our culture, humanism. Well, we are going to live by what is right in our own eyes. To each his own. To each his own. You know, we're, you know, love is love. We are going to define what is right for me is not necessarily right for you. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We are going to define this is good and this is evil by humanism, by human brain power. That's the very essence of humanism. Judaism. Now, now you look at it like this. Judaism. God now comes and defines what is good and what is evil. The 613 commandments of the Torah now say this is good and this is evil. But still, without the nature of Christ in us, that's the best God could do until Christ came. Until the Spirit of God was living inside of his people, that's the best God could do was the 613 commandments of the Torah. God defining this is good, this is evil. Islam, again, I'm just going through the different religions. Islam, Allah, defines what is good and what is evil. What's good? Kill the infidel. What's good? The five pillars of Islam. What's evil? Christian and Jews who worship another god. You see what I'm saying? Everything that we could ever, every, this entire world system is coming from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's defined human history for 6,000 years and now the modern day church is saying we've got to unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. Yet it has defined everything we see. See, now we bring it down to Christianity. What happens is we now, we now say, okay, we're now delivered from the law. But what do we do in Christianity? Is we now take the external commandments of the New Testament... And we now turn them into another law, don't we? Now, instead of the Ten Commandments, we look at the Sermon on the Mount and what Jesus taught, and we then try to do the good Jesus taught, and we try to avoid the evil of what Jesus taught in our own strength and power. It's, I'm telling you, you will never, ever be able to do that. It takes Christ living in you to live that life. And once you discover this, it's incredibly liberating and freeing that Christ lives inside of me. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That he is the one who can do this. See, think about this. What's good? Love your neighbor as yourself. 
Read your Bibles. Now, I'm not saying don't read your Bible. You don't understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying don't read your Bibles. Pray regularly. Have a quiet time. Fast. Witness. What's evil? Lust. Pride. Gossip. Judgment. These things are good. These things are evil. Do the good. Avoid the evil by knowledge, by principles, by willpower. Be a good Christian. Live a normal life. And then so what happens then when we live by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil as Christians with New Testament commandments, what happens then is that we will either become self-righteous or live under condemnation. That's always the fruit of this tree. Self-righteous. I did this good, these good things, therefore I begin to take pride in my commitment. Or I begin to take pride in how good I'm living the Christian life. Or I begin to take pride that I'm better than this person who isn't living this standard this way. And then we look at it and when we fall, and we all will fail, is we start feeling condemnation. I failed. I missed it. I, I didn't hit the mark of what God wants me to do. And we live under condemnation. So we will either go from this, this roller coaster of judgment, self-righteousness, and condemnation. But God has a better way for us. See, this tree is all about, how many times have you heard this in the, in the church today? Live for God. Live for God. Do for God. Go for God. See, it's not about living for God. It's about Christ living in you. And him living in you empowers you to live. It's not about you doing good for God. It's about Christ in you becoming and Christ in you living. And you then, in union with his life, begin to bear fruit and draw from that life. And you begin to do what the, the very works Christ wants you to do, but he does them in you and through you. See, the way I look at it is like this. Is my dog Zeke. See, imagine I tell my dog Zeke, who has animal life. He doesn't have human life. And I tell Zeke, Zeke, you need to become like me. Because really the commandments are a revelation of Jesus Christ. The Sermon on the Mount, for example, is a revelation of his nature. It's a revelation of who he is. When Jesus taught on the Sermon on the Mount, he was teaching his nature. He was teaching his character, his essence. And so imagine me telling Zeke, okay, Zeke, you've got to become like me. Zeke, you've got to wake up at six o'clock in the morning. You've got to grind your Charleston blend coffee. You've got to put it in a coffee press. I mean, can you imagine Zeke trying to do that? I mean, Zeke, all he does is he eats, he drinks, he poops, and he pees, and then he goes to sleep. That's basically the instincts of his animal life. That's all he does. That's all he can do because he's an animal, because he has animal life. And so I tell Zeke, okay, Zeke, you've got to go work software like I do. You've got to seek the Lord. You've got to provide for the family. You've got to do all this stuff. Zeke having animal life, could never, ever live my life because he doesn't have a human life in him. Well, that's like what it is with the Lord. The Lord knows that these commandments, these external commandments, we can never, ever do them in our own strength because we don't have divine life and when we're not born again. But when we're born again, now divine life comes in. Now divine life comes in. The DNA of Jesus Christ is now imparted into you. He comes now to dwell inside of you. Christ in you, the hope of glory, now gives you the Zoe life of God. You now have the tree of life inside of you. You are now in union with the tree of life. You now have his indwelling life so that now you can live up to the requirements God has given us, his commandments. Some of you don't seem very excited. Maybe, all right, thank you. See, Paul said in, in Romans 6, 14, he says, you shall, sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. See, a lot of Christians take this and they go, okay, the 613 commandments of the Torah, we are now set free from that. And you are. 
But we really miss the essence of what Paul is saying here. Paul is really getting us back to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Paul is getting us back to the external commandments, and he's basically saying that the shift has happened. Now the external that says you need to do this and do that, you are not under that system anymore. You are under grace. Well, what is grace? It is not a license for sin. Grace is the unmerited, unearned, I call it, some call it favor of God. I call it the power of God. It's not just the power of God for miracles, but it's the power of God, the power of Christ living in you, giving you power to be what God has called you to be, giving you power to do what God has called you to do. It's a different way of living. See, we're so accustomed to living by the brain, living by knowledge, that this is a rewiring. This takes, this is an entirely different way of living. We're so pre-programmed to live by knowledge that even hearing this message, catch this, even hearing this message, you think you got it because you're getting knowledge. See what I'm saying? See how deceptive that is. You think you're getting it because you've heard it and you have knowledge. Well, that's still, still the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, knowledge needs to become revelation. And I don't know necessarily, uh, for a lot of times with me, what happens is God takes my knowledge and gives me revelation from that knowledge. But so what happens is we sit and we hear a message about it and we say, I've got it, I've heard it. And in fact, I've, I've seen this over and over in the church today is we'll preach a message about the indwelling life of Christ and say, oh, he's, he's said that like 1,500 times or whatever. I'm sure no one's ever said that. <laughs> and you make the error thinking that you have the knowledge of it, but you don't have the revelation. And that is living from the old tree. That's how deceptive this is. That's how pre-programmed we are into this is that we make the mistake of thinking knowledge means life and it doesn't. You see how, you see, I think it's hitting some. You see how pre-programmed we are. You see how the DNA of this tree has so gotten into the way we think. I'm telling you, this is deep. It's deep. It really does take the living and active word of God, the two-edged sword to come and divide between the soul and the spirit. Let me, let me turn to Hebrews chapter, let's, let's turn there real quick. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. I believe the, the writer of Hebrews is really, again, you just take the, the whole, really the whole, so much of the scriptures, the narrative of the scriptures are about the life from two different trees. Everything. I mean, you look at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what Terry talked about. Then Cain goes out from the presence of the Lord and he begins to live by his soul. And he builds a civilization and then... The, the, the godly line living, well, they really couldn't live too much by the tree of life then, but that godly line gets mixed with the line of Cain, and then the, and there's only one left, Noah. And then we, from everything, from the civilization of Cain to Babel, to all the kingdoms of man, to ultimately end time Babylon, is all what life is like when society and civilization and the cosmos, the world lives by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's what it is. It, 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 just think about this. That, that is what it is. And so Paul, or the writer of Hebrews, is getting here, and he's saying this is so intertwined like bone and marrow. You cannot separate it. You are so, we, we are so wired to think this way because of the DNA from that tree, because of the fruit of that tree. We are so wired from this. It's not until the living, active word of God, the two-edged sword comes, and it pierces between soul and spirit. 
There's no other way. And so when you think of the, the division of soul and spirit, think soul, tree of the knowledge of good and evil, spirit, tree of life. See, what he's doing is he's bringing a sharp sword to say this thought, this emotion, this will, all this intertwining of your soul, which you think is so Christian and so godly, is still from another life source, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. From your soul, from what is of Adam. And it's your spirit that has the life of God. It's your spirit that has the indwelling life of Christ. And we don't even know it until this two-edged sword of God's word comes to cut and divide and lay us bare. And we realize, I've been living from another tree. And I would say for my Christian life, 25 years, I mean, I've been saved since I was in the fourth grade. My 25-year pursuit of the Lord, probably 20 years or more, have been living from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You must, you shall. Grit your teeth, do it with your own willpower, rather than the power of an indestructible life you live by. See, it's a whole different way of thinking. I mean... It, 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 I mean, hearing this message almost messes you up because we're so used to give me knowledge, give me three steps, I'm going to go out and do it, not realizing I'm living from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So let's go back now to Romans chapter 7, verse 4. The one thing I want to make sure we understand in talking about this is that God's requirement never changes. The requirements from the external commandments are still on us. Okay? So some people make the mistake in the hyper grace movement. They'll teach a message like this and they'll lower the requirement and the standard and God never does that. God never lowers the requirement or the standard of what he expects from his children. It's what he puts inside of us, his nature, that enables us to live to that standard he's called us to. See, there is a standard, and it's called Christ-likeness, that God established in the eternal counsel of the Godhead before time and creation, the patterned Son of God, that we would be conformed into his image. And that standard has never, ever been lowered. That's, that is the burning desire and plan of God is that we would be conformed into his image. But the only way to be conformed into his image is to have the life of the Son in us. The only way. And so now we're coming back here to Romans 7 verse 4. Paul says... Now, think about it now that we've seen everything we've talked about so far. Therefore, my brethren, you were made to die to the law. And let's just substitute it for a second. You were made to die to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You were made to die to the external commandments, the you must and the you shalls. The requirement's still there. The expectation is still there, but you died to it. You've been put into the grave. You have been buried with Christ in his death and his burial. And now when Christ has been raised, now that Christ has been raised from the dead, you also have now been resurrected with him. And this is not just a positional thing. This is actually real. This is real. This is not some positional thing of being in Christ. You, if you're born again, you have been resurrected. See, if you don't have his life, you're not born again. And I think so many Christians have made the error and the mistake of living by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I'm a good Christian. I do good and I avoid evil. I'm a good Christian. But they've never been born of the Spirit. 
How many people are going to hell in the church because they've eaten from the wrong tree and they don't have God's life in them? Yes. See, if we don't have God's life in us, we cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. So that's why Paul said, test yourselves. Examine yourselves. He was speaking to the church. He wasn't speaking to the world. Test yourselves. I think the American church needs to examine ourselves, examine our lives. Does Jesus Christ dwell in you? Because if he doesn't, you don't belong to him. You see what God's doing here? I believe that so many Christians are on the road to hell because they've eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the name of Christianity, not having the life of God in them. See, this whole thing we call Christianity is about the tree of life. It's about Christ living in us. And him living rather than me. Now, that doesn't mean we don't live. He empowers us to live. He lives in us and he lives through us. It grieves my heart just looking, just, just observing the church around the world. How many are doing the external things of what Christianity says we should do and they don't have Christ in them? They've been deceived by this tree of good, and they think even doing the good things in the name of Jesus is sufficient. And yet they don't have his life in them. That's the difference. I mean, I honestly feel like I'm at the very beginning of living the Christian life. I mean, at the beginning of it. I'm like, Lord, why did you wait 20 plus years to show me this? This is like Christianity 101, and I like went all over the place getting there, and I'm like, why did you wait so long to tell me this? I'm like, you would have saved me so much heartache. But I'm telling you, if you can get this, if you can get this right now, you will save yourself heartache. You will save yourself pain. You will save yourself burnout. It's about Christ living in you. Let's, let's now, let's turn to Romans chapter 8. And I, I would encourage you, read Romans 7 from the perspective that you have, this is about dying to the one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. See, sometimes we think that it's not relevant to us because it's talking about the 613 commandments of the Torah, but Paul's getting at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I believe he is. And now read it in Romans chapter 8. Verse 2, for, for the law of the Spirit, catch this, of life in Christ Jesus, the tree of life, has set you free from the law of sin and of death. See, Paul's telling us, he's bringing the two trees back here in Romans chapter 8, verse 2. The law of the Spirit, the tree of life, Christ and his indwelling life in you has delivered you from the law of sin and of death. He's talking about the law, uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That indwelling life has set you free. The life of Christ has delivered you from doing good and being good and avoiding evil in your own strength and power. Condemnation, self-righteousness, and all that comes with it. Now, let's look now at verse 4. And this is what I was getting at. The obligation or the requirement of the external commandments still apply to us. So everything Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, everything Jesus said in his parables, everything Paul wrote about in his epistles, everything John wrote about in his epistles in the book of Revelation, everything in the New Testament still applies to you, you're still under obligation to obey it. That's what verse 4 here is saying. 
The requirement is still there. The requirement of the commandments is still there. They haven't gone away. But here's what, it, what Paul's saying, that it might be fulfilled in us. It's not fulfilled externally first. It's fulfilled internally. Internally, then externally. See, the external commandment of the law was external. Do this. Do that. It was all external. Do not commit adultery. So if you went all the way over here to the line of lusting and lust, looking to lust and eyes of adultery and all that could be involved in that, but you didn't actually commit the act of adultery, in their eyes you were okay. And Jesus said, if you even look at a woman to lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. Well, they thought, if I go this far and I don't murder, I'm okay. But Jesus said, if you have hate in your heart, you're a murderer. See, what Paul's saying is now, living by the tree of life now causes this requirement of the external commandments to be fulfilled in us. See, think about it like this. Who do not walk according to the flesh. The flesh came into power when Adam ate from that tree. The coupling together of the five senses of the body and the mind, the will, and the emotions of the soul. And so what Paul is saying here, that if we will not walk according to the endemic nature of the coupling together of soul and body, which 95% of Christians are still living by, if we will not live by that way, but live by the tree of life. See, you could substitute the Spirit of God in this passage for the indwelling life of Christ for the tree of life. The tree of life is now in you if you are in him. And you have a new life. You have a new power source to live by, the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. See, the requirement has never gone away. It's now fulfilled in us. In other words, we fill it up because Christ fills us up. And now we, now he lives and he empowers us to live this life called the Christian life. It's beautiful. Now let's go back to Romans chapter 7, verse 5, or no, actually verse 6. Is but now we have been released from the law. We have been delivered from the law. We have been set free from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. See, God, in the body of Jesus Christ, we have been delivered from that tree, having died by that which bound, we were bound. Now catch this, what he's saying. So that now we serve. That word actually means serving, obeying as a slave. So now Paul's saying here, so now we become obedient, not by the commandment coming first and us striving to obey it, but now internally, the Spirit of Christ living and empowering us with His grace. He then empowers us internally changing the desires and the affections of our heart by the indwelling spirit so that now we become obedient servants of him. It is beautiful. This is beautiful. This is, this is absolutely beautiful, what God has done. This is the gospel. So that we serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. In other words, the external commandments, living by those external commandments, you must, you shall, do this, do that, and striving to do that, all that has died, and now you live by the Spirit. You live by His indwelling life. His indwelling life now makes your soul, He wants to bring your soul into a greater union. And that's what Paul was getting at Let's look now in Philippians chapter 3. Verse 
In, in Philippians chapter 3, Paul's really getting at this in verse 10 is that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. This is five years before Paul dies. Five years before Paul dies. Paul has done all these incredible things. Planted churches throughout Asia and Europe and the Middle East and all throughout. Wrote most of the New Testament. Had seen Christ. Had been caught up to heaven. Paul comes to the end of his life, even, ha even many years after saying in, in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. So this is way down after that statement. Paul is still saying there is a deeper death and resurrection I have to experience. There is a deeper deliverance from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and a greater release of the tree of life I need to know and I need to experience that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. I believe he's talking about an internal resurrection. I believe he's really dealing with the soul life. I believe he's dealing with a death working into our soul in a much greater way to deliver us from the effects of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Death working in the soul so that the power of life can come into the soul. So that the power of resurrection life can come in to the soul. So that now we can be in a greater union with indestructible life. That's the way I feel. <laughs> Amen. It is, it's awesome. This is such good news. That's why Paul got here at the end of his life and he said, I want to be conformed to his death. He wasn't just wanting to suffer. He wasn't just wanting to experience pain. No way. Paul wanted the old man fully experientially dead. See, what Paul's getting at here is his, his legal position. I have died in Christ, coming to full harmony with his living condition. Now Christ is working his death in me. Five years before his death, Paul is saying, I want to be conformed to his death so that I can attain to the resurrection of the dead. Now, there's debate about what exactly that means, but I think one thing it definitely means is, is Paul wanted the soul life in Adam fully crucified experientially. He wanted the full deliverance from the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it will take us a lifetime to get set free. But God is big enough to do it. We will always see and always need the deliverance or the dividing between soul and spirit. Always. For the rest of our life, we will, the Lord will say, you're living from the wrong tree. I was talking to Josiah Bennett at the conference, and, and we were talking kind of about this, and he was saying, yeah, what I, what I, when I was teaching the overcomers, I was teaching people how to overcome. I was showing them, okay, step one, do this. Step two, do this. Step three, do this. Step four. He said, I was showing them how to overcome, but I wasn't showing them the way to overcome, which is Jesus the way. See, what, what he was saying here was I, was I was telling them principles. I was telling them keys. I was telling them this and that. And rather than bringing them to the indestructible life, living in them. And when he said that, I was like, yeah, I would be guilty of that as well. The requirement does not change, but the life source is vitally, vastly different. <laughs> to live by his life. See, it's liberating. Now this doesn't get, again, this does not get us off the hook. This does not in any way lower the standard but it's Christ living in you 
that empowers you to be who God has called you to be and to do what God has called you to do. Living by his life, living by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I, I want to ask you, Lord, that revelation would be given, Father. Lord, let there be revelation given. Lord, I want to pray right now, Lord, that you would begin to divide between the soul and the spirit, between the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. Lord, you would begin to make known and reveal to us the life source we have been living by. Lord, I pray that we would see how much of this tree we've been living by. Knowledge. Give me the knowledge. Give me the information. Give me the scripture. Give me the teaching. Rather than by the divine life of Jesus living in us, Lord. I just pray, Father, just do a work in us, Lord. Let's actually stand right now and wait on the Lord. Lord, divide between the soul and the spirit. Lord, I ask you for revelation. Lord, I feel like I'm at the very beginning of this. I think we all probably feel that way. Lord, I pray that you would teach us, Lord, how to live by divine life. <laughs> Lord, I ask you, I cry out to you, Lord, that you would teach us to live by divine life. Lord, I pray the light would shine into our heart, Lord, that we would be able to see where we've lived by the soul. We've lived by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and all its many sources and all its many branches, Lord. Just give us a revelation of that. Father, illuminate with light, I pray, Father, that we would live by the life of the Son of God. I, I just want to give an altar, I rarely ever give an altar call for salvation, but I, I want to give one today. If you've been a quote unquote living to be a good Christian, but don't have divine life in you. I just want to invite you to surrender your life to Jesus. And just, if, if you want to come up front and, and just, we'll, we'll pray for you. But if you have been living and trying to do the quote-unquote Christian life without surrendering your life to the Lord, without having his spirit come live inside of you. I just want to invite you up front for that. Just to say, I am going to, I'm surrendering my life to Jesus Christ. You could have been baptized. You could have been baptized thinking you were a Christian. But I'm telling you, you don't know you're deceived because you're deceived. You could be deceived and not know it because deception is deception because you don't know it. And so if you, if you felt like that, because that, that was not premeditated, what I said about that. If you feel like that applies to you, I just want to invite you to come up front and give your life to Christ, the tree of life, not a Christian religion, but to Jesus Christ. Larry, can you sing us uh, Amazing Grace?